Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Jake Friedman. And I'm Brendan Hansen. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. In today's episode, we tile some palaces in the 2017 mega hit Azul. A game of deliciously elegant <laughs> game of deliciously elegant matte and tastefully tactile pieces <laughs> that dishes up delightful decisions on an unforgiving plate. It's going to be a great discussion. I am very excited to get into that with the meat of our topic. Uh, Brendan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jake. I feel like I made you just fumble the intro a little bit there because I had it say Matt for some reason. But I think it was supposed to say like material or pieces. I don't even know what that title was. So, well, there is like a mat, a deliciously <laughs> elegant mat. It's like a Chewy place cardboard. Mat. It is a place mat. I'm fine with it. I'm not changing it. Let's go. Uh, uh, so, uh, so before we're getting into our ratings and reviews, we need to let the people know that our next episode after this one, if you're a pre-planner or if you're anyone else, is going to be our big end of the year mega episode event where we will go through every single game that we covered as a featured game on Decision Space this year and rate them from number 30 all the way up to number one, our Decision Space Game of the Year. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, And also, you can get involved with this episode. We have a, at the end, after we share our cumulative rating, we will be sharing our community's top 10 games. To participate in this and add your voice uh, to the episode and, and to the discussion for our community's top 10 games, that we've covered, all you need to do is go to decisionspace.com slash rankings, and you'll it will take you to a pub meeple page. Uh, when you click on the link there, you'll go to the pub meeple page and you'll just the template will be preloaded for you. It takes about five minutes. You'll just click through, uh, you'll be you'll be presented with two games, you'll pick the one that you prefer. Uh, you'll do that about 50 times, and then you will get your list, and it will be automatically added into our community list to to share out at the end. Uh, It's going to be a ton of fun, and we really hope you participate in it. And if you haven't played some of the games, that's totally okay. You can either rate rate them as sort of if, do you want to play this game or this game more? Just like what appeals to you more. You could approach it as, oh, I really liked that episode more than this episode. Or you could, if you want to, you can go in and remove games that you haven't played. That's totally fine too. And also, just to be sure, it's decision space podcast.com forward slash rankings make sure you you. get the podcast in there yeah Yeah, i've messed it up but the link will be in the description of the podcast uh so you can just go there and click on it um lastly the last kind of update here and and this is gonna be such a big episode we really hope you guys tune into it join join us for it i think we could get up to maybe a thousand downloads on this episode if like everyone comes through and shares out that would be huge for us as like an end of year thing for our podcast i really want this to be a big one a big event Uh, so we're hoping you come through and as part of that i'm running a really small little contest if you want to participate all you have to do is send us your six games so so brendan and i both created our own lists of our you know top rank 30 to 1 uh, and then we went through and we saw which games that we covered this year are we have the biggest disagreements on between our lists so if you want to enter the contest all you have to do is send us an email to uh decision space dot at gmail.com is that, is that our email <laughs> Jake's going to look it up really quickly. And I will say that if you're confused about what games we're even talking about, these are all the games that we covered in the entire year. So these are the 30 games that we did feature episodes on from Kanagawa all the way up to Azul, the episode we're doing this week. I'm really excited. Obviously, if you've listened to some of the show, you might have some instinctual thoughts on what Jake and I are going to disagree with. And we both did a PubMe poll, so we were we're going to be really surprised to see maybe even where the games rank for each of us as well. And if anyone is able uh, to, whoever is the most accurate, I think you might be crowned Decision Space Fan of the Year. Yeah, Decision Spa 
decisionspa at gmail.com. You can send us six games there and indicate which one you think is the biggest disagreement, and that will be worth two bonus points. Whoever gets the most right will win a prize. It will either be a game from my collection or a, or a gift certificate to an LGS near you, and you will be fan of the year. Uh, shout out on the podcast. So you can email that to us. You can DM me on Discord, or you could send us a direct message on Twitter. All acceptable. Just six games and indicate which one you think is the biggest gap. All right, that's it. That's all the pre-show stuff. Brendan, are you ready to get right into the meat of the episode? And we'll get started as we always do with our ratings and slogan. I'm so ready. Let's get into it. Azul's streamlined gameplay and decision-rich drafting mechanics makes it a delight at all player counts, but its near-perfect tightness doles at 3 and 4, where the cutthroat and rewarding decisions of the zero-sum two-player version feel lessened, but the fuzziness of the decision space overall increases and leads to, in its own way, really interesting dynamic decisions. Azul's a joy from the first factory to the last 8 out of 10. Very nice, Brendan. But you are wrong, unfortunately, because Azul is a 10 out of 10 for me. It is not always a game I would pick to play over another heavier, deep experience in some settings, but it is a game that I always want to play. It is a game that will never leave my collection. It is the game I perhaps recommend to people the most because it's so fantastic at two players. Uh, It's so fun still at four players. It has just the right amount of uh, randomness with the assortment of tiles, uh, with strategy, tactics, thinking ahead. I thought about this. I thought hard. Do I want to give this game a 10? And I just can't really think of anything that I find fault with in this game. I think it's dang near perfect. Uh, and I absolutely love it. Is this your first 10 of the year? I couldn't remember that. I feel like I gave Castles of Burgundy a 10. Oh, yeah. I think you gave Castles of Burgundy a 10. And I might have given Bruges a 10 also. Okay. So it's pretty good. It's not quite a Stefan Feld game, but it's pretty good. Maybe I dish out 10s, but it's it's up there for me. And I think I appreciate, I've always appreciated this game. I think I had it ranked as like an 8 on my BGG page. But after really diving deep and playing it a ton with you, playing it a ton with people in the Discord at higher player counts, it's just risen for me. And I'm really happy with, with 10 as my rating for this game. I'm so excited that this game is a 10 for you because Feld joking aside, I feel like every Feld game you play somehow gets like a plus one bonus. So in some (laughs) ways, Azul is Jake's highest rated game of the year because it's a 10 not designed by Stefan Feld. So the fact that we have another designer slotting into the number 10 in our final episode of the year, I'm really excited to get into it because I think there's a lot of things that I love about Azul. But for me, there's little things about the decisions and even just the flow of the game generally that I think frustrate me a little bit. So I'm always happy when we can, you know, I'm I'm getting my sword out. I'm ready to get maybe, maybe do a little duel over why this decision space isn't a perfect 10. Um, But yeah, this can be a good episode. So if you aren't familiar with Azul already, uh, this game is designed by Michael Kiesling, also known for great games like Heaven and Ale, Tikal, Cole Baron, Mexico, Mexica, excuse me, and the palaces of Carrara, which Brendan and I have been digging into quite a bit. Uh, It is published by Next Move Games in 2017, plays between two and four players, and Brendan is going to tell you a little bit more about how it plays to give you an idea if you haven't played it yourself before we dive into our decision space discussion of this game. Brendan, take it away. Azul is a tile drafting pattern building game for two to four players. It has two key zones of play, a shared factory space where players take turns drafting from pools comprised of the game's five tile types, randomly set out at the start of each round, and each player's personal tile board, where drafted tiles are arranged into patterns to score points. At the start of each round, four tiles are randomly selected and added into factory spaces in the center of the table. The number of factory spaces scales by player count, and on a player's turn, they select all the tiles of a single type 
from one of these spaces to add to their board. For example, a factory space might have two red tiles, a blue tile, and a black tile. They could take the two red tiles, they could take the blue tile, or they could take the black tile and add them to their own board. The remaining tiles in that location are then moved to the center of the table, which itself becomes a location that can be drafted from, building up or maybe waning down as the game goes on. Each round, the first player to draft from these center tiles receives a special tile allowing them to go first in the next round, but this comes at the expense of filling in the negative one point spot on their player board. When players draft tiles, they'll slot them into spaces on their player boards in preparation for adding them to a five by five grid where they're ultimately trying to arrange tiles into. These preparation spaces range in size from one to five, denoting both the number of tiles they can hold and the number needed in that location for the tile type to be added to the corresponding row at the end of the round. For example, if you put two tiles into the row with four tiles, at the end of the round, if you haven't finished filling them in, you don't get to add any tiles to your board, but if you have four tiles in that four row in the preparation spot, you get to slot them into your grid, potentially scoring you points. If players draft tiles that they cannot add to a preparation spot, or if adding them would it cause them to exceed the number of tiles in that spot, they'll receive negative points, increasingly so based on the number of tiles they can't validly use in a round. At the end of each round, if a preparation spot is full, tiles get slotted into a player's board, clearing that spot for the next round, and scoring that player points for each adjacent tile in the column and row the tile is placed into. This means that placing tiles such that they connect to already placed tiles is key, key, for scoring points in a zool. At the end of the game, which occurs at the end of a round when any player has fully completed one row on their board, adding all of the five different tile types to it, players receive bonus points for each row they completed, each column they completed, and for each tile type in which they successfully placed five tiles of that tile type onto their board. The player with the most points at the end of the game is crowned the victor. Wow, I didn't, I knew that your rules Overviews could be informative, but I didn't know that they could be so beautiful. It, <laughs> that was art, my friend. Thank you, Jake. Let's start by, as we always do, characterizing the decision space. We like to talk about the size, the type, the feel, and the clarity as just some of the elements that sort of uh, confine, define what a decision space is in a game. Brendan, I'm going to make you take the first stab at this. In some ways, it's so awesome to me that Azul is the final game that we're covering of 2021, because I think it brings together so many of the different concepts that we've kind of developed over the course of the past year, our first year of Decision Space as a podcast, and really trying to use this lens. Because, I say this because overall, the Decision Space is a waning Decision Space game, right? You're starting with tons of potential. You could put any tile type anywhere on your board. Every row is your oyster. Every column is your oyster. Even more so the case if you're playing this B-side variant, which I'm sure we will get into, but it's still true of the A-side, right? You have this incredible flexibility. And every round you're making decisions that are lessening the number of options available to you. But at the same time, the tile set is basically the amount of information that you have about the tiles that are going to come out is increasing, whereas your flexibility is decreasing somewhat. Obviously in the three and four player game, the tile set is being recycled. So that lessens a little bit, but especially the case in the two player where the hundred tiles basically are guaranteed to be used once. Um, and maybe if the game goes longer than five rounds, it'll recycle and you'll get a huge amount of randomness, not a huge amount, but a large influx of randomness at the end. I think Azul is really fascinating as this sort of punctuatedly waning game where you have this every every round you have this new injection of randomness, but then it's known information except for the decisions your opponents make in terms of drafting, which is going to create these really interesting dynamic pairings uh, that you can kind of predict, but I mean, you can't always predict. So for me, that keeps it super interesting. And I love the tension of Azul towards the end of the game where you've really maybe tiled yourself into a corner um, and you're just hoping, oh my gosh, I hope Jake doesn't stick me with these 11 yellow tiles. I'm going to be so screwed. Yeah, your description of waning space and specifically a punctuated waning space is exactly right. Um, and I think that's something, you know, before we started this podcast project, I had never really thought about the shape uh, of a decision space before. But I yeah. think now that we have that terminology, I'm realizing that just for me personally, like these punctuated spaces are something that I have a huge preference for because i feel like it 
you know, you get a new chance to a new life almost as it is many times throughout the game, right? At each round, you're getting a whole new puzzle to unravel and solve. And the the inputs to your puzzle is going to be slightly different to everybody else's. And it's very similar in that way to Castles of Burgundy, which for the longest time was my number one ranked game of all time. Um, And I just think it's so it's very interesting that these games have such a similar type of decision space uh, that they almost could map right on top of each other. Um, but, you know, I think if you just ask somebody, hey, do you think that the decision space in Azul and Castle of Burgundy is similar? They'd be like, no, not at all. But really, it's fascinating that I think they are the exact same type. Yeah, and... Just if you're new to the show, if Azul is your first episode that you listen to a decision space, what we mean by punctuated waning too. I said what we meant by waning. The punctuated nature is like that that increase of information that you get at the start of every new round, right? So your information narrows and narrows as your the decision space narrows and narrows, and the start of each round it spikes back up a little bit and then wanes again and then spikes back up and then wanes again. And it is really interesting. I, I hadn't even thought about that myself, Jake, that both in Castles of Burgundy and in Azul, it's the exact same, a new tile set is coming out and you're filtering that through the decisions that you've already made. You're probably thinking about the tile set and what could still be there in terms of how that relates to the decisions you're making. Um, it's totally fascinating. And I agree. I think it gives the game this driving sense of momentum um, while having really valuable tension within every round, right? You don't have that like the arc isn't this slow downward slope the entire game, but this like nice within every round, this like tension goes up as decisions wane and then it releases and then you get to read the table again. Um, And I I will say, I think in this episode, we're going to struggle somewhat to describe some things like clarity in terms of the decision space, because one thing I'm sure we'll get into is how differently Azul feels or plays at each player count uh, in terms of the way the tile math works. At two players, the decision space and the, the tile math, we like to use these terms like fuzzy and clear, right? Like how fuzzy are the decisions you're going to be making and how how clear are they? And at two players, the clarity is like, it's very stark. You you have a pretty strong sense of what's going to be coming, what tiles are still going to be in the bag. Whereas at three and four players, especially, the tile sets are changing over so much that the fuzziness in the decision making just increases. And also just because there's more people at the table, right? So it's harder to get in the mind of every single other player and what they might do because you don't know directly what the input into their decision is going to be in a two-player game where you make a decision, then I make a decision, and we pass back and forth. I would say even in the two-player game, it definitely feels like a clear decision space in that at a certain point in the round, there's there's like a, a, a breaking point where all of a sudden you have enough bandwidth in your brain to calculate mm. out, okay, I do this, it. then they do this, then I'll do this, then they do this. But that's really impossible, at least for me, at the beginning of the round because there are just too much there there's too much possibility space where depending on like when people start taking out of the center what you what combination of uh, matched colored tiles end up in the center which could drastically reduce the number of turns back and forth for that that particular round um there's just too much to calculate so i think it's interesting there too where it, it feels different from some of the other games we've covered in that like that the clarity of the space is so dynamic where it changes from, I I wouldn't say like extremely fuzzy, like you still can make a pretty good guess like what your opponent might do next, but there's definitely some fuzz of how this individual round is going to proceed from the beginning to the end. But then that is constantly growing more and more clear over the course of each round. And then you get that punctuated moment where you get all an influx of brand new and somewhat random information uh, that makes things less clear once again. I love, too, that we've talked about how one of the most clear trademarks of a waning decision space game is 
oftentimes these games will get down to a point where there's no decisions left at all. And oftentimes that's one of the best moments in Azul. Um, and by best, I mean absolute worst, right? Where it gets back to you and you've been left with no decision and you have to take five tiles you can't place in your board. They're all falling to the tile floor. You're racking up negative points and you look like the dunce at the table. Everyone else is smiling, laughing at you. Oh, wait, no, that's just me. I'm the only one who gets put in those positions. <laughs> no, um, not true. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I do think it's really interesting how Azul not only does that once, but does it at least five times, right? Where the end of every round, there's no decision left. The the You've made a decision that has led to you being the position, potentially of being the player who takes those. Um, but there's so many considerations of who gets stuck in that seat based on how you're cutting these different factories and who's taking what in which situations. And I think also... We probably shouldn't get into this now. We should talk about it in scoring. But I think why it is so interesting to me that you can't judge out uh, and you no, you're I guess you, you can't math out. You're more judging how you think the play of the tiles is going to go is so much because of the value of every tile in the game is different to every player based on the setup of their player board at any given situation and is changing based on the decisions you make in the round directly leading up to it right so it, this game wouldn't work if like the tiles were all known values it works so well because they're so dependent on every other decision that's made at the table leading up to that and decisions you have and i think that's the magic of the game and that's what makes as well works that i think can kind of hide underneath the design until you take a moment and step back and say, oh, this is so interesting about the game is that this works because every tile, every tile pairing, every three tiles together, all the factory, uh, the way that the factories are randomized is recontextualized based on my board. And that's how it makes the hate drafting work and it makes these sort of valuations around the table and adds that texture to the decision space. And I love it because it's so simple. It's emergently doing that in such a cool way. Yeah. And I think what you just alluded to with like the end of each round is like either triumph or disaster. <laughs> yeah. Is it's such an impressive thing about the design. Like we've talked a lot about games that provide these jackpot moments uh, where everything lines up and Azul is great at that because you'll have these turns where you know you've completed every row that you have any tiles in is is completed so you'll be starting with a brand new fresh slate in the next round that feels amazing and everywhere that those tiles are getting slotted into is chaining together to give you progressively more bonus points with each one and that feels amazing it feels like hitting the jackpot or you're one short in three different tiles and now you have to take 10 negatives because like you have nowhere to put these five red tiles and you are the one who gets stuck with them. And that feels terrible. So it's just really does such a good job of like the design ensures that at the end of each round, you're going to get a jackpot and you're going to get somebody busting. Um, and I, I think that is pretty amazing to have those kind of heightened emotions in a game that is I mean, at its core, like this is an abstract, abstract, abstract game. What's so interesting to me, too, is the room for busting it as you learn the game or as you come to understand the decision space, you start to appreciate how much being stuck with one tile in your five row of a color that have mostly already come out is even worse. Like you just throw it down to the tile floor. It'd be so much better if the decision space just said, okay, I can just take this tile and put it down and I never have to think about it again. But the fact that the game is leaves a decision space that's perilous enough to stick that tile down there that you know you're never going to finish. Like that that one red falls down and you're like, oh, there's probably like three reds in, left in the bag for the rest of the game. I can't believe my opponent stuck me with this one. And that like, I love that the, Early on, when you're when you're playing Azul the first time, that doesn't feel bad because you don't know how consequential that can potentially be for the progress you're making. It's even worse on like your four row, right? Where like you have some potential to fill in a few fours. Um, and I love that the more you learn Azul, the more you understand that that's like the worst sucker punch in the game is being stuck with one of those and the opportunity in the future being reduced so much. And I think that's something that I really appreciate is how simple the game is, but how the the more you learn it, the more you come to understand what the consequences of all these decisions are. And obviously a lot of games are like that, but the, for me, Azul sticks out as that being so special because it is such a simple system and it takes time to sort of appreciate how all of these moving pieces that seem like they're just sort of, 
you know, shifting slightly are actually swinging hugely in terms of the consequence. Let's move on to the mechanisms in this game, if that's all right with you. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so let's start out by talking about, and we've already touched on this a bit in our kind of overview of the decision space, but let's start by talking about how the drafting actually works in the game and the implications of that. So one thing that's important to note is, as, as Brendan did allude to, it this dramatically changes based on the numbers of players in the game. Uh, in a two-player game, you have five tiles out. Each of those are, C, or sorry, five coasters out what are these are we do we call these factories factories yeah yeah <laughs> so forced yeah <laughs> <laughs> you got you have your five coasters and each of those are seated with your four starburst cubes and <laughs> so you have, so you have 20 total tiles uh, in a three player you have seven factories seated with four tiles each for 28 and in the four player game all nine tiles are used seated with 36 tiles so the implication of how much, how many more tiles and tiles of similar of a similar suit, the same color, could end up in the center of a four-player game versus a two-player game is it's like uh, an exponential difference more than an incremental one. You, you could end up with seven, nine, ten of the same tile uh, in a four-player game, and in a two-player game, that really just can't happen yeah and i think part of the reason it can't happen is because it's so much the you know that the consequence of it getting back to you is much you you understand what's happening but also it gets so enticing when they when they build up and just the math of it alone the 20 tiles as you're saying jake you're never going to have 11 of the same color or the math of that is just so wild that it's so unlikely um i think that really is one of the things that shifts the decision space the most because in the two player game filling in the four uh the hopper of four and the hopper of five on your player board where you're trying to slot those in really is a multi round pursuit in most circumstances mm -hmm. sometimes you get outlandishly lucky and the tiles come out and there's a coaster you're the first player there's a coaster that has four reds and you're like okay great i can i can get this four red and maybe if you're really lucky, it's going to slot into a row that you're very excited uh, because you've already completed a lot of the column uh, in that spot. But for the most part, those four and fives are a multi-round affair. And in three and four players, you can sometimes finish the four and five much more reliably, which shifts the scoring potential, I think, to columns a little bit more. Uh, and also the bonus, the five of one of each column all five of each tile color become more relevant in a way that they're not as relevant at two player. Um, so I love that about this three and four player game that it really sort of like opens up the viability of paths towards scoring, um, depending on what you're focusing on. But it also, you know, like you said, you, the chance to get burned is just way hotter. You're just like the gas has turned way up. It's amazing how different the game feels at two where you have this incredibly cutthroat strategic and tactical experience. And four, which you have what I would describe as a fairly chaotic affair. It's just so much is going to change with the board state by the time it comes back to your turn uh, that it, really planning out too far ahead is impossible. I mean, I guess you could say very difficult, but I love it both ways because I think at at four players, it's just it's just fun to play out, see what happens. You can make smart strategic decisions. The same kind of breaking point will happen there where you can start mathematically figuring out, okay, like I'm going to likely get stuck with the eight blue ones in the middle, uh, or can I manipulate that in any way by, you know, taking from a certain coaster? Um, you can start playing with that. I mean, I think it's fun, but like in, in many ways for such a light, fun entryway game i think it's fantastic that it does provide for that varied of an experience because when i'm showing this to new players i sort of want that random chaotic feel and if i get screwed with the, the blue tiles through no falls of my own like that's great that's that's funny and and i think that's what i'm here for I love too that, so the game really does operate in both ways. And I think one thing that we talked about with a previous game that's sort of a similar, you're drafting uh, from the center table, you're adding them to your own player space, uh, a different game is King Domino. And in that game, it's another one that feels very different at three and four players and at two players. 
also very tactical at two. For me, way too loose at three and four. You loved it at three and four. And I think for me, Azul ends up being way, both versions of the game end up feeling more successful and also feeling more similar. So for me, that's a huge strength of the game. Um, and I love too that obviously the, the two player version is the more cutthroat, it is the more mathy version because I think that if you're playing at two, you're probably playing with the same people over and over again if you're not playing a competitive space. And I think that's good for the game somewhat, as long as you're closer in skill. And then, of course, if you're playing with a larger group, the fact that there is more randomness is going to create the ability to play with players of more disparate skill because you're unsure of what the outcomes are necessarily going to be, potential bumps for players. I think that it's just really brilliant how it all comes together. One thing that I will say that I don't love about the drafting mechanic, I think it's brilliant. I love that I can put this game in front of anyone. My mom is actually visiting right now, put the game in front of her. She was like, oh my gosh, I have to buy this for my her sister, my aunt, who she's so excited about the game for. And I think you mentioned it's sort of that entryway game that you could play with anyone. And it really is. Um, and But one thing I don't love about it is how much the decisions of your partner player, the person directly to your right clockwise, have the potential to impact you. At higher player counts, it can become so important what the person directly next to you is doing and how that feeds into the player directly after you in a way that I think puts some onus on them to at least be looking at what the other player needs. And for me, that's one slight weakness of the decision space is how much you have the potential to impact maybe unfairly someone else's board. Um, whereas in two players, that becomes the game in a lot of ways, right? The I'm playing both of our boards, boards, boards. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to hate draft, uh, and I, I'm ma- ensuring that you never get this huge payoff. Uh, so I, I don't know. For me, that's know. one of the things that make it not as strong at the higher player accounts and why I'm not rating this game a 10. What I'm hearing you say is that there's a lot of player interaction. I th- I mean, I do understand the criticism, like that that player interaction is like offloaded on the person to the right of you. But I feel like a, that speaks to like how important the player interaction is in this game, which is a strength and B, I just think that's something that's present in so many games, right? Is that not similar in other drafting games? It totally is. But a lot of other drafting games and Azul, obviously like I'm not criticizing Azul as a product. I think it's yeah, brilliant. better it's not. Like, one of the yeah you'd be an idiot i'm not gonna be sitting i'd be like clundering on the podcast if i was criticizing azul as a product and i'm not going to do that because i think they michael Heasling and the team at next move games made every decision that they needed to make to make it an incredibly successful product and game i love the game i wish though that it was just this turn we go clockwise next round we go counterclockwise it's such a simple little thing that they could do but they wanted it to be at that reduces the problem that i'm talking about right at least then okay this game i'm drafting leading into to jake this next game i'm drafting leading into Maya. Um, so the how that is factoring into it is lessened. But I think, like, what can you say? I, it's, it's such a small nitpick that at my own table, like, we could play it that way if we wanted to, right? It, yeah. But rules as written, it is one thing that I think is annoying about the game that I feel a little bit more than I wish I did. But that's not that we don't need to, like, you know. I know it's interesting. It's interesting feedback. and um, And I think that also sort of speaks to the conversation we had with Tony about irrational actors a little bit. Like there's Mm. not really anything in the game that requires shifting player order from, from right to left, right? That, that is solely to account for the potential that one person is not playing as skillfully as somebody else around the table. And I think that is an interesting question about if designers should account for that. The, the other thing to, factor in there is i guess the the fact that whoever takes first from the middle becomes the first player so things could kind of become i maybe potentially a little bit wonky there as well where if somebody's getting like the second pick a lot because the person to their left gets the first player in the first round and then the player to their right gets the first player in the second round which maybe that gives then that person in between a different kind of advantage. So I, I do think it's interesting. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just I, I'm yeah. fascinated by the comment. That's sort of the classic, like, selectable or draftable first player opportunity, getting that initiative problem of the power ends up going to the player to their if it's a clockwise game to their left. I think in Azul, it's somewhat mitigated by the number of factories increasing and how later on in the game, the number of variability in the tile sets 
it probably mitigates it some just because the amount of randomness that's there. Um, but yeah, that mechanic is... Can we just talk about that now? Because it is such a strong consideration in terms of the drafting, which is when do you go to the center of the table and when do you take that tile? Um, because I think that that tile is incredibly strong, um, but you don't want to take it too early because oftentimes you're going to hurt your tempo in terms of your ability to get more overall tiles into your 5x5 five five grid. If you're using an early selection to just take one tile from the center, maybe, um, you could really hurt your potential to get ahead in tiles place overall. But having that first pick can be so strong, especially in the two-player version, where you have a chance to dictate how you're going to start the basically how the entire board unwinds like you're the person who gets to spin the top in the section of the board that you want to spin and watch how the tension goes and i i love too that obviously this tile it costs negative one right like it's printed negative one you add it to your, your board it costs negative one but early on the chances that you are adding more negatives to your board is pretty low because you have so much flexibility in terms of your spaces where you're slotting in and later in the game adding a negative one tile to your uh, board down on the tile floor, I think it has the potential to end up costing you way more if you end up dipping into the negative twos or the negative three. So I love that even that selection, and later on in the game, it's more valuable. You, in the fourth or fifth round of the game, you really want to go first, but it has the potential to cost you even more. And I think that's such a brilliant little emergent aspect of the game too, because your options have lane. Um, so this is one of my favorite design decisions of the whole game very well said i agree with everything uh that you just laid out and yeah i think that's one of the most fascinating thing about the negative one tile is it doesn't cost you negative one point it fills up a negative one point slot which yep. is the lowest amount of negative points you could possibly get uh for putting any tiles on the factory floor so it's, it's there is a significant opportunity cost there and yeah it is uh, a really powerful benefit to get the tile, but there is some risk with that too, because the tiles you may desperately need might not be there. Uh, it's fantastic in a two player game if you can get three tiles in your first single go, uh, but very commonly there aren't, won't be any tiles with three. So then what significant advantage is there over your opponent? So I think it's interesting. It's, there's just enough going on with it that it's always a fascinating decision of how much do I value going first next round versus that cost. One of the things about this mechanism that I think mirrors the design of Azul overall is what you just said, right? It's so hard to figure out what the actual value of this tile is, in part because of the the influx of all this random information when you put all the tiles out, you don't know what they're going to be, is that in some ways solving that problem lies just beyond the cognitive horizon. And for me, the, the puzzle in Azul overall is a puzzle that lies just beyond the cognitive horizon, at least at the start of every round. And like you said earlier, there's that inflection point, that tipping point in the round where, okay, oh, I got to the horizon. Uh, and I think that's, for me, some of my favorite games exist in that way. And it's so cool that Azul is a game that's about being over that horizon and then pulling it in. We've talked a little bit about the drafting mechanism, which I think we both agree is brilliant. Let's sort of talk about some of the things that stem from that. Mm. I mean, I'll start with one thing that I think I like to think about at the forefront of each of my turns, which is if I do X... Will I have at least two options? And this is primarily in the two-player game. But if I take one tile, will there be at least two other places that I can do mm -hmm. the next thing I need? Um, because that fundamentally prevents your opponent from being able to thwart your plans in, in a significant way. And I feel like a lot of the drafting mechanic is actually sort of built around this idea of keeping your decisions open and and, and and in that way it's kind of this perfect encapsulation of our idea of decision space where a decision space is like the number of decisions you actually have versus choices things you do that don't benefit you and i feel like that is the core of this game it's trying to make sure on your next turn you will still have 
decisions to make. It's almost like you really feel uh, in Azul, the decision tree being pruned. It's like as if every time you're drafting from this tile pool, you're, you're like taking a pair of shears and chopping off a section of the decision tree uh, as thing, and then throwing the limb that you've just chopped off into the center of the pile for everyone else to take. Um, and I think you really feel that. And it is about that flexibility. Like you're always doing that mental math of, okay, if I take this blue and slot this single blue, because there's only three blues out on the table, am I going to be able to fill it without my opponent getting in the way? And like you said, it's so palpable at two. Um, and I think for me with Azul, one of the other considerations that's so important, and I'm really curious how you feel about this, is when is it the right time in terms of, Azul is so much a game of timing because you can see the tiles and you know, for example, okay, I'll always be able to probably fill in my number one spot and I need to do that. It's really important that I fill in my number one spot in terms of maximizing the points that, I might, that I'm getting from every single slot. Um, but when is it the right time to only take one tile versus taking two tiles or three tiles um, or two tiles to put in the four tile slot. When is it the right time in, in the turn order to do that? I think that decision is always top of mind for me. And I, it's one of those cognitive puzzles that I don't think I'm the best at solving. And it's always right over that horizon. Sometimes you just nail the decision, obviously. But knowing when to take that sort of slower move, I think can be really difficult, especially when you have options. If you're building your board in such a way, right, that you're building in one of the center columns. So, and you're always trying to put them adjacent to other pieces you have so okay i'm going to maybe draft to the left or i'm going to draft to the right so you're you're sort of playing those boards and knowing when to commit when to force your own line um to me that's another really important consideration in the game is when do you close off that openness and sort of leverage the potential that's still there yeah absolutely i mean the game is it's all about efficiency like so many of these euro games i know that word doesn't mean a lot on its own so i'll try and explain what i mean there are several competing factors for efficiency at any given moment you want to be efficient in taking tiles taking yep. more tiles to fill up more of your board is generally better than taking fewer so that's one thing you want to keep in mind the second thing you want to keep in mind in terms of efficiency is being efficiency in terms of points you want to make sure the tile colors you're taking will be slotted in adjacent to other tiles. Um, so you have those two things that are competing at all times. Uh, and then you also need to be efficient with respect to the timing of the game itself mm. and making sure that you will be able to you know, complete entire rows and columns and potentially even uh, all of a single color uh, so that you'll be able to keep up with the bonuses in the game. So you really have these three things at least not factoring in, you know, what your opponents are likely to do uh, or what you should be doing to make sure your opponent is not able to play efficiently that are all competing all at the same time. And I think that really does sort of nail down why this game is it seems so simple it seems calculable but to actually nail down at any given time this is my best move because uh and being able to actually like explain to yourself what the reasons are for that is incredibly challenging and it's like a puzzle that i will continue to come back to again and again um and I love that about it, that it's constantly testing you. It's always at the edge of the horizon, as you had said. I'll let you talk for a second because I've been rambling. No, I, I really appreciate that. Maybe this would be a good time in terms of thinking about, you mentioned tempo in terms of, and it, for me, what that means in the context of Azul, right? You have initiative which is I get to make the first choice in the subsequent round by taking that center tile. But you also have tempo. And the idea of tempo in Azul is overall in the course of the game, I have more efficiently slotted in tiles into my board than you have, right? I'm ahead because not only have I taken more tiles overall, I've taken more the right tiles to slot them into my board such that they've been adjacent to other tiles. And I probably have more tiles on my board than you do, period. Whereas if the game is ending, maybe overall I've placed 18 tiles and you've placed 15 tiles into my 5x5 five five grid. And that can be a huge point difference at the end of the game, where towards the end you're scoring six points, maybe seven points, 
even five points for putting a tile in your board, those that difference of three tiles can be a huge point difference. And that's why it becomes so important. But it's not always all about that. And that's why Azul works. That's why it sits beyond the cognitive horizon. Because it's about getting the right tiles for you at the right time in the game. Because if I slot in three and I get ahead of you, right? If I'm taking five, if I'm able to get four tiles, Jake, and I get ahead in the number of tiles that I place, but I have my light blue nice little snowflake pattern tile over here and who knows nowhere next to no other tiles. It doesn't matter. That's a one point tile. Right. So it inverts the sort of way that tempo works because it's not just about overall tile efficiency. Um, it's really about the, the point efficiency, which is like, okay, that's a canned phrase that you could say about any game you play, but it feels so much more important the way that tiles score in Azul well, to make that distinction. And the simple fact, as, as you alluded to, right, you can spend a ton of time and effort to fill in your five row and get a single point for it where you could get seven points by putting a single tile into your yep. top row. Um, so you have to be careful that also like taking a set of three off the board and slotting it into your call, your row that takes four or five and then leaving it unfinished is potentially a great thing if it's early in the game, but it's potentially setting you up for failure late in the game. So there's always, always more to think about, uh, I think, than it seems at first blush. Coming off that too, you uh, there's another tension on your board, right? Where you just talked about the tension of why you don't necessarily want to fill in your bigger slots, but you might also be in a position where you don't want to fill in your smaller sort of hops because my ability to hate draft from you is decreased. It, it costs me more to hate draft if I'm going to take the two reds that you need and put them in my row with four, if I know I'm not going to fill in the four, then it does to, at the end of that, to take the two reds that you need and put them in the one slot. Okay, one of them will go to the tile floor and I'll lose one point for it. But if I stole seven points from you by doing that, it's so much more efficient for me to hate draft in that way, where if I'm scoring, even if I'm only going to score three or four and I'm deducting all of the potential points, those are the only tiles you wanted. Uh, it's so much more important in some ways to be flexible and utilize the flexibility that the tile floor, the negative points can give you, which I think is another thing that shifts the more you play Azul, right? Early on, you're like, okay, negative points. I don't want anything to do with this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not in the negative points business, none of that. And then the more you play, you sort of realize, oh, these negative points are a tool that I can use to enact true pain on my opponent and screw up their board and make them suffer. And I, I want to play to make Jake suffer. That's why I'm here. There are so many turns in a game of Azul where I would, when we're playing against each other, and I take two tiles, and I just know that you are so mad on the other side of the, <laughs> <Yep>. uh, <laughs> of the computer. Uh, and I think that's, that's like pretty, pretty wonderful. And the same, the same for when you take tiles I need as seemingly little benefit to yourself. And I just think to myself, Brendan, why are you like this? Why have you done this <laughs> to me, your friend? Uh, and I mean, that's just, it's, it's great for that. Um, and yeah, like the tempo considerates with the end of the game is important too, because I find myself making the mistake a lot where I don't fill in my top row in a mm. given round. Maybe I'm focused too much on trying to, especially early on, trying to get tiles that are central into my display because those will be the easiest ones to build adjacently off of. But if you don't put a column in your first row at any point in the game, then you're kissing those benefits goodbye mm. because the game almost always lasts exactly five rounds and especially amongst uh more experienced players i think it was uh i don't want to credit the wrong person i think it might be was indoor in our discord who shared quite a few thoughts about the game yeah. and i thought one of the key takeaways was always play for five game or a five round game because you may at the end of five rounds not want the game to end because you feel like you're behind but that means somebody is always going to be incentivized to end the game yeah uh, so yeah so missing out on a single opportunity to fill in your one or even two space row is is enormous in in the game and even three and it's it's so much an indoor we should say has been playing this game a ton i think indoor is ranked in the two top two percent probably or top five percent on board game arena so they 
he shared a lot of different things that we can glean from the sort of stats on board game or arena that are very interesting to me, which is that in terms of winning in a two player game, at least finishing columns seems to be more powerful than finishing rows seems to be more powerful than finishing columns or a set. I think that would be less so the case at three and four players. Um, But I, I do think that sort of sense of playing for it to end in five games is so important. And at higher player counts, sometimes that's going to be less likely. Um, just depending on how the tiles end up being pushed to the middle and where people choose to place them. Or at least when I've played, more likely uh, games are more likely to go longer at three and four players than two players. That could be incidental, um, but I'd love it if I could get access to the stats on, say, Board Game Arena and see if that was borne out. Um, but generally, yeah, it's a five it's a five round game with the potential to go longer. I think what happens in three and four is early in the round, everybody wants to take two or three of the same tiles, right? So I fill it in there and then everything dumps the middle and then nobody wants to take, fill their number one row in using three tiles with two going Mm. down to the factory display. Uh, So, or factory floor rather. So I think that is possibly an explanation to why you notice that. I'm not, I don't know what is optimal there and it maybe is cause for me to kind of reconsider how I am approaching that. Um, I, I do often find myself, for whatever reason, not finishing the first, the number one row mm. in, in my games. And I mean, I do pretty well in the game, uh, but I think I'm like so focused on adjacency, like getting the middle mm. and being efficient with tiles. That's kind of funny, right? Where it's like, oh, yes, I've been so efficient to fill up my three space, but I've neglected the one space. So it's like, is that even efficiency with respect to scoring and the tempo of the game i'm I'm not sure even now no totally and again this is another example of the the puzzle of azul being just beyond the cognitive horizon right where yeah it seems really advantageous this is another example of this to finish uh getting the set of five of the same tile type on your board filling in every space of the same tile type that seems amazing you get 10 points for it that's huge but depending on getting there, if you have a round where you're sort of, okay, I filled the first the first spot, the second spot, and the third spot all with blue tiles, it feels super efficient. Oh my gosh, I have three out of the five tile types finished. Easy clap. I'm just going to get at least four and five later in the game. But I've effectively set myself up. I've made myself, I've exposed myself to being exploited because now I have three rows on my board that are filled with a color that everyone else at the table knows I can't take blue and put them in these first three rows. So that's a, it's another example where it feels like you really want to seize that opportunity, but it would be way better to always leave yourself with row, more rows open such that you, you can sort of force your way into it in the fifth round, you finish with like the one blue, good to go. And I think that's such a consideration that controls the randomness, where sometimes I, I don't hear people complain about the tiles being too random in Azul. And I think a huge part of that is if you get paid off really early, it's limiting your options later. So if you find yourself in a position where early on you get this like really lucky thing, it's in all likelihood, it's just limiting the things that you can do in future turns and make you more exploitable to hate drafting. And I think that sort of self-balancing of the decision space is really interesting. You'd never not take really good tile luck if it comes your way, but it's something that you're forced to play around and consider in your decisions going forward. Yeah, I think the luck versus skill in Azul is also could be like overlaid right on top of Castles of Burgundy. Another game that has a ton of random elements in it between the tiles that come out, the dice that you roll on your turn. But there's so much ability to maneuver within it um, and be strategic and play smart that you don't come away from the game feeling like you just had a random luck-filled experience. I think Azul is a game with a tremendous amount of randomness that we've described that happens over the course of the game. And and yet it feels like when you play Azul, it feels like, oh, yep, just another no luck abstract. And you have to like, honestly, like pinch yourself and just say like, wait, like there's, there's a lot of like randomness and chance that comes into this game. I think it's the type of game where the even though the the amount of uh, randomness in the system is so high, I think partially the the punctuated nature of it coming in at the rounds helps reduce that somewhat. The amount of control you have and how you set up the center pool, depending on when you take from either the center itself or when you're taking from the different factories, 
all come together to make it a game where I think the better player wins this game, what, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, especially at two players. Like the chances of you beating someone who's significantly better than you at the game it is very low in Azul. I, I would agree with that assessment. Though, I don't know if it's that high. I mean, there is there is randomness, but but yeah, I, I agree. The I agree. It's so hard any time we're like, I think the better player is going to win X percent of times. Like, we have no idea. Yeah, we we're like no estimating idea. the number of buttons in a jar. Yeah, it's like pretty much that kind of game. Yeah. I want to talk about side A versus side I, B. I do too. I was going to move to that. Were you? Which okay. one do you like better? B, easy. So this is the back side of the board where none of your spaces are dictated to you. Um, Mr. Uh, Kiesling has not come into your house and he has not said, this is the exact tile pattern you're going to do. He said, oh, do, do whatever you want, but it's going to be interesting. And I think that flexibility um, is another example of, oh, the horizon just got way bigger in terms of the metaphor that we've sort of been building throughout. The possibility space in terms of what you're doing feels endless and the puzzle, the, the amount of puzzliness at the end of each round and how you're going to set yourself up, it's just, it's so great. And I think the, the A side is awesome for teaching because it, just to be that little bit of extra complexity that I think might throw people off, especially like my ability to put, the, put it in front of my mom and my aunt who haven't played a ton of modern games. I certainly wouldn't show them the B side first, but I might show it to my mom on the fourth time uh, once I feel like she has a pretty good handle. Or I showed, you know, when I was playing with my wife, Maya, we played the A side once and then I was like, okay, let's flip it over. Let's play the B side. Which yeah. side do you like more, Jake? Definitely the B side as well. I think it heightens everything that's great about the game it heightens the decision space um so what more could you ask for i i do agree i mean the a side's fine like i still have fun playing the a side you still get the experience of playing azul it's still a full game of azul um but it doesn't allow you to be as creative um and expressive in, in how you play the game so yeah i agree like play teach teach the game on the a side and then as soon as you're ready at least try out the b side i think a lot of people have this game and have just never played the b side because it's like the b side and it like doesn't it's just like blank it looks less interesting um but if you haven't yet it it truly is in my opinion a richer more rewarding game experience it seems like I, I could definitely see a case too for people being like, oh, the B side's complicated. There's going to be rules baggage there. But it's really simple. The rule is you can never repeat a tile in a row or column. Easy. That's the whole that's the whole rule. That's the whole yeah. B side. Which and I think like it's in the abstract, you say that somebody you're like, oh, this is gonna be hard, but it's really not in practice. When you play it, it's you can see the board in front of you, you can see where you can and can't go. And it's no problem. Especially though, it can create a little bit more perilous of a decision space where maybe if you're drafting too many of the same color in a single turn, you sort of force yourself into situations where, oh, I actually can't place this anywhere. Um, or I can't place this exactly where I want because I slotted this in here. You could still never like start a space to where it would be an illegal place True. at the end. Yeah. So it like the, it kind of like the rule enforcement is on the front end. Yep. Which, which is pretty nice, too. You won't get to, like, scoring and think, like, oh, no, I've done something wrong. I love, too, that maybe this is a quick point, but the, oh, I've done something wrong. I like that the design of Azul sort of says, okay, this is probably going to be a five-round game, maybe six at most. But if players are playing really funky, oh, it could be a seven-round game or an eight-round game. And that the game sort of leaves room for that as players get better at the game. Um, right. If you're playing really early on and no one is driving the game towards finishing by filling in all the rows, everyone's kind of having a, a lazy river float down the Azul tile uh, tile river. The game's like, OK, have your fun that way. That's great. I want you to be able to experience the game that way. The rules are written in such a way that that's no problem. And then the more you play, the tighter it's going to be pull, pull you back and pull you back. And you end up having this five round game. I think that's really interesting. That game that's designed in such a way that it for experienced players, it's almost always going to be five rounds. But for novice players, it could be a longer experience. Before we get into our final thoughts for the game, Azul is a game that has been re-implemented time and again. And another one is now on the horizon uh, or out, potentially. If you can get Queen's Garden already, please let me know. Because <laughs> I want it. Uh, so Azul, Brendan, do you have any thoughts on Azul Stained Glass of Sintra, the first Azul re-implementation to come out? So this Azul re-implementation 
the, my only thoughts on it, I, and I'm going to be straight with you, Jake, I have not played any of these three other versions, so I really want to hear your thoughts on them, but I'll give you my, my quick summary of each of them of where I'm at. Stained glass, delicious, see-through starburst great <laughs> super interesting summer pavilion oh now with diamonds amazing why why would i want to play that queen's garden there's a castillo from freaking el grande who doesn't want that version of azul um but from my perspective every time i hear someone talk about one of these other versions of the game uh it's either wow michael keesling is stuck in azul azul prison he's going to be making azul for the rest of his life which okay first of all what a happy place to live. Who doesn't want to be stuck making versions of your own game forever that everyone is so excited every time it comes out. Poor Michael, Michael Keasley. And two, uh, it's that everyone says the original Azul is the most interesting. So do you think that that's how you feel, Jake? So I played Azul Stained Glass of Central once at a con and I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I was like, I'm going to go out and get this. And then I just never did because I already have <laughs> Azul. Oh, yeah. I then played the next year, the second Geekway, I played Azul Summer Pavilion, and it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. It feels a little more gamery. You can do mm. a lot of like combos, uh, and you can like set tiles off to the side to use later, which makes the game feel a little bit more oh, that's cool. lush and like less restrictive. Um, Did you think was... I'm gonna go out and get this? And then never go I... out and get it? So I won the Play and win game. So oh, like nice. everybody who played it gets entered into the drawing and then they give away copies of the end. So I won it. So I owned it and I played it a bunch more times with my wife and really enjoyed it and then moved on from my collection because I had the original Azul. And I, I feel like so, so, so far Azul is the tops for me, though I really think each of these games is great in their own right. And I am absolutely excited. You know, I will be first in line to to try and potentially purchase queen's garden whenever i can and i'll probably play it a good dozen times and then i'll think to myself wow this is a great azul game but you know what's really great azul the classic <laughs> version that i have and will always love queen's garden too i believe correct me if i'm wrong jake has uh hexagonal tiles it does is... yeah well, it, that... it... <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that. It, it has hexes and it uh the interesting thing i could be wrong about this but the interesting thing i think i know about this uh from our decision spaces we want to explore episode is that the new tiles don't come out all at once mm. they come out like slowly o over time like perhaps it's one of your actions on your turn is you could like flip over a tile that will then be populated with four new hexagon spaces so that seems like the biggest departure i'll have to play it and i will report back on this podcast once i do but it seems like the biggest departure from the azul formula yet yeah interesting okay closing thoughts on azul for me why why did i not rate this game a 10 azul for me is like a delicious bowl of chicken noodle soup in the winter and i feel that way about it even if it's the summer because it's always a pleasant game it's always interesting always having fun slotting tiles in the the rising tension uh, the momentum of scoring more points at the end is super fun but i think in some ways what i mentioned about the the turn positioning and also just the the variance of decisions ends up feeling narrow and narrower the more you play it and i love the decision that it offers but i find myself on repeat plays feeling more and more like i'm making the same types of decisions a little bit too often for it to be a game that i want to come back to no, I'll play it a hundred times, but I'm gonna. It's gonna be a solid eight the hundred times I play it. So maybe that's like, a, you know, I don't. I don't know. It, it's so lovely and nice, but at the end of the day, it just doesn't have the the lemon zest and the chicken noodle soup that adds that little bit of flair. All right, and for me, why I did give it a ten. We've talked so much about the decision space, and I think what it does with the economy of rules to create such dynamic and genuinely exciting moments, along with decisions that kind of keep you coming back to try and crack the puzzle to keep refining your own heuristics uh, through which you are navigating the game state uh, which I think is a, is a great way to navigate the game state I love games that sort of allow you to have general ideas about what you should be doing at any given time without the need to really calculate every single thing and I think while Azul seems at first blush to be a game that's going to reward the latter, the calculations, 
I think in reality, it is a game that really incentivizes the former. Figuring out like general ideas of what to do and then refining and refining and refining those. In this category of sort of classic gateway games, I put Azul right there with Ticket to Ride, with Carcassonne, with King Domino. Uh, and, 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 and at in the same time, I think it's right there with the best entry sort of two-player games too. You know, you put it with Fox in the Forest, uh, King Domino again, Seven Wonders Duel. And out of all of those games, when I look at my collection, Azul is the one I personally want to play the most. So for all those reasons, it's a 10 for me. I'm so mad right now. <laughs> you just convinced me it's a 9. I'm so mad. <laughs> I feel like I just lost a draft of Azul. I'm just sitting here. And you, you're right. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful game. So Let's that, go play. Yeah, let's... I think I think it's your turn on the board game arena. But anyway, those are our thoughts on Azul. A wonderful game. We both really, really love it. Um, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Decision Space. You can find us online at on Twitter at Decision SPA. We can also be reached by Gmail, which I apparently learned is decision spa at gmail brendan is on twitter at burnside bh i'm on twitter at jake freed j-a-k-e-f-r-y-d and as always we'd like to thank hembry for our intro and outro music reach out please join us next week for our end of the year spectacular blowout episode it's gonna be awesome and take the time to do the rankings at decisionspacepodcast.com forward slash rankings. It'll take you three minutes. It will be so fun. You'll help participate in putting your voice in for the Decision Space Community Game of the Year. And come back to figure out what Jake and I's favorite game of the 30 games we covered was. And also the worst. Don't you want to know what's <laughs> sitting down there in the 11 piled drags on the tile floor? We'll see you next week. Bye, y'all. Bye.